Hey, Western Oklahoma schools, listen up. How would you like to win a $5,000 interactive smart display for your school? Thanks to video reality and audio video business in Oklahoma City, you could be awarded one. Here's how. From now through February 28th, anyone can text in one time per day through the entire promotion. The winner will be announced during our live coverage on the ParagonTV.com and Cool 94's coverage of the Saturday, March 2nd Class A and B Basketball Championships. Here's how to participate. The text line number is 580-225-9697 and in the text, simply type in the one word name of the school you choose to support. We are so proud to partner with Video Reality that through their gracious gift in this promotion, some lucky school will be awarded a $5,000 interactive smart display. Remember, send a text to 580-225-9697. Type in your school's name. It can only be one word. And send it. Limit is one vote per day per phone number. Good luck. Video Reality, your audio, video, and control experts. If you build it, he will. It's the Skinny on Sports Podcast with Aaron Cow. I throw balls far. You want good words? Data language. Talk real sports with a real man. Come after me. I'm a man. I'm 40. And now here's the be-all, end-all, know-it-all of high school, college, and pro sports. Aaron Skinny Calc with the Skinny on Sports. We're talking about practice, man. I'm the MVP. Good morning out there, Western Oklahoma. Welcome to the Skinny on Sports right here on 98.1 FM, the Sports Animal. Glad to have you along for the next hour. we got a full show. High school hoops. We'll talk about the district tournaments in Class A and B that were held over the weekend. In my mind, everybody won that didn't play each other. Oh, that Yeah, right. As far yeah. as the Paragon Network. Hollis, though. Hollis, though. Never mind. Uh, but outside of games against each other, it was a good week. For the West Central Oklahoma teams, we'll tell you how some of those games went, who won, who's moving on, and where in the regional tournament. High school wrestling regionals are coming up this week. We've got Coach Murray and Coach Green coming in from Elk City here. I'm not real sure exactly when they'll be here. They may come just come busting in the door at any point, <laughs> and we'll have to pivot uh, to them. But we're going to talk a little high school wrestling with the regionals, girls on Tuesday, boys Friday and Saturday, so we'll get the rundown on the high school wrestling. And, of course, the Super Bowl from last night. What happened? How did it happen? I thought there were pretty egregious coaching coaching mess-ups on both sides at the end of that game. And there's all kinds of other stuff with, obviously, Patrick Mahomes. Sooners didn't have a very good night in that game. I didn't really – Pay attention to all that. Well, but Creed Humphrey as... couldn't snap it off the ground. <laughs> Trent Williams got back-to-back penalties that cost a first down when the Niners at first. Uh, Braden Willis, the biggest call of the game on that holding in overtime that ended up costing the Niners a real chance of kicking a, or scoring a touchdown. And, by, and honestly, James Winchester got bailed out on the longest Super Bowl of all time. It was a horrible snap that uh, Tommy, two, Tommy Two Gloves, what's his name, Tommy Townsend, Got on the ground that Butker knocked through. One very good night for the six sooner. Or well, there were six of them in it. One very good night uh, for most of them as they went along. And Dakota and Sean are just happy as little larks. I wonder what that's like. I wonder what it's like to get outplayed in two Super Bowls by the same team and you win them both. I wonder what that's like. Uh, I don't know. See, as Cowboys fans... We don't know what the, it's the, like. The norm is outplay somebody and your quarterback costs you the game. Sure, yeah. For them, it's the other way around. <laughs> you can get outplayed, and, but your quarterback is going to make enough plays to win the game. <laughs> so we can talk Super Bowl here off the first, Wes. So we wait on uh, Green and Murray to get here. 225-9698 is the phone or the text line. That's 225-9698. Give us a call, shoot us a text. We can talk about any of those things or whatever else might be on your mind. Feel free to chime right in at 225 225- Nine six nine eight. How are you today, Jared? Good. How are you doing? Uh, very well. It's nice to wake up to some sunshine. Sunshine. You know, this to me was about if if it's gonna snow. This worked out about as well as it yeah. could because the the ground temperatures were so high that it's not causing any real travel issues. Didn't even yesterday. Uh, it's pretty, but. 
at 52 and then 60 something the next couple of days after that it'll be gone and you won't even know it was here oh no yeah so it works out about if it's going to snow i prefer it i mean we need the more the moisture's fine it's great but this is this is about right just get it do it get out of here don't cause many problems yeah it was it didn't affect yeah it didn't have any problems and i was worried about yesterday getting out and about and um at one point my wife god bless her she wanted to make a seven layer dip and she wanted guacamole from el patio <laughs> like well have you seen outside so she said oh the roads aren't bad so i went out yeah got out went to el patio that's the only venture i went into yesterday and wasn't bad at all wasn't bad at all and you're right it'll be it'll be gone and we need and much needed moisture so happy about it and you're right it didn't um I mean, imagine if this was coming down on Saturday. You know, if that happened on Saturday or even Friday, it would have really messed things up. Yeah, I don't think so. You don't it think didn't so? have any. It didn't mess anything up travel wise. It now, with an abundance of caution, I'm sure That's it probably would. But it, but, it's, that. but I mean, it didn't. I think down in Hollis, they actually postponed school today. Yeah, so some think, of them. I mean, they're you know. Because I think further south, it was heavier, which was nuts. Over at my dad's at Foss Lake. He got like the moisture, like the rain, but none of the snow. Mm-hmm. And then over in Canute, of course, and then around here, it, we got all the snow. It, it blew my mind. He put some on Facebook. And said, "Where's the eight inches of snow?" And I'm like, you, "That can't be." And I text him like, "That really? You didn't get anything? It's like, just rain." It's like, Nuts. That's why it's so hard to predict. The oh snow yeah, They'll because tell you. yeah, it, because here, if it gets way cold, it really never snows. The, the major yeah. snows happen when it's like 32 to 30 degrees. Well, guess what? If it's 33, it ain't going to snow. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just, it's, it's such, yeah. it's so weird. All right. So, how was uh, your Super Bowl watching? Uh, enjoyable. I, I didn't, we didn't, because of the snow and the sickness that's been in our house, we didn't have anybody over. But um, I enjoyed the game, despite the <laughs> outcome that I didn't want. To. I mean, even though I picked Kansas City, I thought it might be a little bit more high scoring game. And my wife even said, Man, this game's kind of boring. It's like, not really. I, I kind of enjoy these low-scoring games. It, it keeps you on the edge of your seat. Every every possession matters. So, I enjoyed it. Um, um, enjoyed the food and the game, the halftime show. I actually enjoyed that too. So, how about you? Commercials I thought were the best in about ten years. I don't know. I couldn't hear anything because we had about ten kids <laughs> just yeah. screaming yeah. from the top of their lungs. Over the the worst thing about the snow was they couldn't go outside. Ah, uh, yeah. And play basketball or whatever they want to send them to, do. to the garage or something. The garage or? <laughs> is full. I can't even go, and it's cold. Yeah, it was a rough one. As far as trying to hear the game, watch the game, obviously. Yeah, uh, man, I thought it was. You're right. It, it was funny because you started seeing, golly, this is so boring. Is anybody ever going to score? It, it's just the way that football has been allowed to become, with all the different rule changes, everything favoring offense that anything that has changed over the last 20 years has all been in favor of offense and everyone that's and it's obvious why when you see a classic game like that being knocked daring it because there wasn't enough scoring to keep people entertained it's just the it's the ADD world we live in right now oh yeah that is you know the the instant gratification i thought it was fantastic it it, it was and i one of the kids was sitting there on the couch as we were watching it, and I literally said right before it happened, you know, someone's going to make a mistake. This game is going to come down to one uh, one team making a, a major error, and that's going to it's going to really affect the outcome. And about two plays later, the punt thing happened, you know, and then Mahomes scores the, the touchdown. They're the only one in in regulation, right? Seven, much field goals, yeah. Um, and that to me was the, the play of the game. Yeah, yeah, that turned it around. A one play drive from the thirteen or whatever, wherever they got it, and and, and it kind of at that point it didn't seem like the like the 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 Chiefs had much of a chance to go say seventy five or eighty yards or more to score a touchdown. But then when right. that happened. It was like everything changed. It was like I, I, I don't know. It just seemed like that play 
even though they weren't getting in the end zone, the Chiefs started to control the game. Until that point, I didn't feel like they had any control of the game. I actually thought the Niners should have been 10 points further ahead at halftime. You know, fumble in the red zone. I get it. The Chiefs did too. So those things kind of kind of equal each other out. Yeah. But, you know, the, like I mentioned, the penalties on Trent Williams where, you know, at the first game when, not, when P- Purdy was way, got off to a way better start than, than, what, than what Mahomes did. But it was so eerily similar to me as the last Super Bowl between these two teams, where yeah. you, where it's like San Francisco. You walk away, and if you're the Niners, and I heard driving in Nick Bosa's comments, it seemed like somebody ran over his dog, and I get it, because you 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 you, you got to today be thinking, we let it go, we were the better team, and we let it go again. Yeah. Twice in four years to the same team, but here's the problem: is has this league come down to the Chiefs have Mahomes and nobody else does? Sure feels that way. You know this. This is one of those. Everybody and their dog. Vegas had to have taken a bath last night. Although some of the, although the bigger bets it seemed like were actually on the Niners. But I think they were like eighty percent of the tickets were on Kansas City, and what was everybody? Nobody even had a reason except for they've got Patrick Mahomes. What was my reason going? Yeah, to picking they, them? they've got Patrick Mahomes. As soon as they, uh, when San Francisco went up three and gave the ball back to him, I looked. My wife said, "It's over." Oh, I did too. But uh, oh, in overtime. Yes. Oh, I can't believe they didn't score a touchdown going in before the overtime well, happened. That, you know what? I actually said that too. I can't believe they but held him to a I field said, goal. This is this is over. I mean, you give him, and I said it all last week, and it came true. You give him that one drive, and he got it. No, and he got two he instead. Got, yeah, yeah, but yeah. So you have to. Here, here's and it the thing. Sure feels like it's it's him and the rest of the league. You have to do things. We saw this in the height of Tom Brady's powers. You have to do things so uncon- unconventionally as a coach to beat them. You have to take risks. You cannot. What Kyle Shanahan did in the, at, the, at the coin toss of overtime ought to get him fired. You cannot take the ball first. You can't. You can't let him know what he's got to do. Right. You absolutely can't do it. What the hell was he thinking? I almost don't think he knew the rules. I know a bunch of the Niners players said they didn't know the rules. Said they... McCall Hardiman didn't know the rules. They didn't realize the change in the over- you, But you cannot let Mahomes dictate overtime. You can't. Now, not that they would have punted on the fourth and a foot from what the thirty-four in overtime. I mean that dry, I mean there was a fourth down on the first set of downs. I think. That Mahomes got you know ran it around the corner. Mm-hmm. Not that they would have punted, but if but at least if they they knew they had to go for it. Everybody's griping about Romo. Romo made that point as soon as the coin toss happened. What are they doing? You can't let Mahomes know what he gets to do or what he had. You cannot yeah. do that. That was coaching about practice. By Kyle Shanahan. Kind of folding, like, in and the, what in the, the hell is Andy biggest... Reid doing at the end of the regulation? You got six seconds and a timeout, and Mahomes isn't going to screw around. What is he doing? Well, the first the, the first play, play took, took four took, seconds, uh, three or four seconds. They yeah. put they put one they back put to one ten. Back on, okay, it took four seconds. Yeah, and I thought, okay, they're going to get one more, and, and they kicked the three. I, and I said that to my wife too. I said, man, I figured they would take one more shot here. There's plenty of time. I mean, this is plenty of time to do a quick shot here, but um, maybe I don't know. I don't know. I'm not trying to defend Andy Reid, but he was like, "Well, oh, somebody I, ought to I before still, he got his butt kicked by Kelsey there yeah, in the right, first quarter." Yeah. But maybe he's thinking, "Well, I still have Mahomes. I can send this overtime and win this thing. I have Mahomes. You guys yeah, there's don't." Yeah, some truth to that. <laughs> you know. So, but still, I mean, enjoyable game overtime. Well, and, and I mean, the Niners, I, the Niners for the first half. Dominated special teams. Dominated. And then in the second half, what happened? They had that. Don't forget about the blocked extra point. Everybody on the text line saying that's exactly right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The blocked extra point was humongous. It allowed it allowed Andy Reid to make that choice. Yeah. Because it didn't have to have a touchdown. 
That is true. That is it's true. Been that, a four-point game. Yep. Yes, sir. Yeah. And you don't know how you don't know how the rest of the game plays out if they don't do that. I get that. I get all of that. But it's still the truth. That one point came up massive, and as soon as it happened, you knew it was going to. Instead of 17, 13, 16, 13, you're going, oh, my goodness. I mean, think about all of you know, they blocked that extra point on the play where Winchester had the terrible snap. They get it down. I mean, Butker kicks it between three hands. <laughs> and it just goes through. Yeah. You know, it just they're, they're, sometimes teams are, they, they make their own luck. And it seems like, you know, give Chiefs the give give them the credit for making the plays. And and being able to yeah, the, the the one of the plays the Chiefs made and Leland just put it on the text line. It was coming out of the two minute warning. And the Chiefs had the third or the, I'm sorry, the Niners had the third down. Chiefs only two timeouts. And uh they blitzed. McDuffie knocked it, knocked that pass down to force Kansas or to force San Francisco to kick the field goal. Because I, I mean, I was already to the point as the Niners were kind of marching at the end of the game. You get under two minutes. Chiefs can't stop. They, like you can run the clock on that last on the third down play because of um, them only having two timeouts, mm-hmm. right? And I'm I'm already thinking as they cross midfield as it's getting down toward the two minute warning. They have a chance to not give the ball back. And at that point, and at that point, they let them they let Kansas City back into the game enough to where you know you knew both everyone knew you can't give it back. Mahomes touches the ball. This is going into overtime. If not a Kansas City win in regulation, you know he just has. He's there. Mm-hmm. You then that's what I mean. You can't go for it, I guess, on fourth and four because then a field goal beats you. But that's some of the things that you're gonna have to start considering in order to beat the Kansas City Chiefs, right? Because Mahomes is so good, and I mean the execution of that that last drive in over or in regulation, it was crazy. They were at midfield in three plays, and he threw the ball eight yards total. You know what I mean? They, they just—he's he, so—he's so calm and he's so good at those late game situations, and he understands the clock and he understands the time, all of that so well that there was no doubt they were getting a field goal. It was just a matter of whether or not they were going to be able to to score a touchdown to win in regulation. Yeah, I thought that was a huge play. Yeah, any other ones? Any others that stand out? I, there's not, not three that nec- stand, other that stand out. To not me. necessarily just plays exact plays i think um injuries like with greenlaw going out that that kind of i wondered how much that how much he was missed i mean th- well yeah think about that he's running around the field after a punt and just falls down yeah nuts and then the special teams i i there is a point I almost text you i said who's who's a because i'm watching you know the the i was like is a punter gonna get the mvp because they kept pinning him deep or was that because the good coverage or just dang special team mistakes with the return i mean how many times obviously the big one there's another one it kind of who was it who kind of fumbled it got right back on it it was the chiefs yeah the one time Isn't that crazy and i think it was uh somebody tweeted it said it, it, it has to i mean it's infuri it has to be infuriating to see you have one job <laughs> and they continue to make boneheaded mistakes like that you know when the fir- when that play first happened you thought what is ray ray mcleod doing he'd been so conservative Mm-hmm. Uh, there were there was a couple of them where he called for a fair catch where I thought, man, there's nobody around you. Yeah, but he'd been, and then all of a sudden he tries to make that play, and you're going, what is he doing? And then you realize it hit the guy's foot, and so it, you know it's all he could do. I mean, I guess jumping on it would have been a better choice. You know, th- but those are just kind of those bounces of the game that always seem to go. You know, the, like <laughs> those plays go the Chiefs' way, and some you know you make your luck in a lot of ways as well. I thought. To me, the other there there were three massive plays that won't go down as anything in the stat sheet, but it continues. He did this. He did this against Buffalo, and he did it against Lamar, and he did it three times against Purdy. And that was Chris Jones, just enough pressure to hurry Purdy's throws on plays where he had guys open for touchdowns. 
There was one in the first quarter where he's stepping in. He's about to step into a throw. I can't remember if it was Ayuk or maybe it was Jennings. Was all I mean, beat everybody down the middle of the field, but he had to hurry it and he overthrew it. He did the same thing to Debo in the in in the second half, and then the last play that the Niners ran. Juwan Jennings was open. It was going to be a touchdown. And Jones got in his face enough to hurry that he couldn't get it. He couldn't make the play. None of those plays will go down as sacks. They might go, they'll go down as hurries, I guess. But Chris Jones, without making a play, made the play, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we saw it with Allen. Everybody was mad about him not throwing it to Diggs over the middle. Well, he had a touchdown. But he couldn't step into it, and he, and he threw it short. Same thing with the, the Lamar play and, of course, that one. And then, you know, I, I don't know what happened because the Niners couldn't get pressure in the, the last two and a half quarters. They, they dominated the first quarter and a half or so. Mahomes was running for his life. It felt like he was, yeah. And then all of a sudden, it was just gone. You know, it, it, to me, Bosa, Randy, Randy Gregory, Eric Armstead, um, there was one other guy that kept on his name was constantly called in the beginning of that game that was just gone in the second half nothing you know you might flush Mahomes out of the pocket or you know keep him hemmed in there you know you could tell what they were trying to do and you know his legs then at the end when you're trying to you're trying to do something that you're not supposed to be doing Mahomes' legs just killed him Bosa came inside on that fourth down play, and Mahomes just strolled to the outside. Makes another great scramble when they lost contain on him. And even even that play to Kelsey on the little middle screen, Bosa chased instead of doing what he would, yeah. had done. But you get down in those situations, you're forced to try to do something that you're not supposed to do. Uh, Brock Purdy, I thought he played okay. Down he didn't play as good as I thought Brock. he would. I'll be honest. He didn't make any mistakes. Didn't make mistakes. But he didn't make any plays either. If he's, he's not going up against Mahomes, is he winning that game? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the Niners beat. I guess ultimately, is is he their guy? 49ers commit to him. That's the question now. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. It depends on what they what they believe. Because you look across there and you think, yeah, we were really close, but man, if we had a, a guy, I mean, you're not going to get a guy like Mahomes. I was going to say, but Mahomes. if you had, but if you had somebody that can make another, an extra, make a play, and I think Purdy is fine. I, I would, I, if if it's me, I'm I'm riding with Brock Purdy. Mm-hmm. I think he's proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that he can manage that team. The question becomes. What happens when Debo loses a step? What happens when McCaffrey loses a step? What happens when the offensive line isn't as good as and it is now? That's the great question. Right? That's the big question. Right. Is, is, it, is it the collective whole around Brock Purdy that is why San Francisco's good? Or is, San, or is Brock Purdy just a good game manager? I mean, he did not turn the ball over. He protected it. He, you know, he had an okay day. A, 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 some would say a good day in the Super Bowl. The only problem was he went up against Mahomes. But – you're right. If McCaffrey, you know, and we kind of saw it. We kind of saw what what injuries did to that team where they lost like three in a row. There for a little bit, it didn't seem like they were going to have anybody left on offense. But McCaffrey and, and Purdy, you know, Kittle went out for a little bit. Debo was dinged. You know, where was Brandon Ayuk? And, and maybe, maybe you got to give more credit to the Kansas City secondary. You know, with Snead and with McDuffie, you know, those guys are fantastic. And San Francisco and their front office, they they, have, they obviously have built a juggernaut of a team here in the NFC. I mean, they're going to be contenders again, I'd say, next year too. But they kind of – I mean, I'm just going off a of memory here. They kind of have a short fuse with quarterbacks. With Jimmy G's situation, they traded away Trey Lance. Are they going to have a short fuse with Brock Purdy? Are they going to have the patience to keep him and, and – See what they got, and that's some of the questions they're going to have to answer in the future. I think if it's up to Kyle Shanahan, they keep him. If it's up to the front office, maybe not. Grass is not always greener, though. Right. It was this time. You know, I th- you th- think back to the Jimmy G Super Bowl. He missed throws. He missed a huge throw at the end that could have won him the game. I, I wouldn't say 
I wouldn't say Brock Purdy missed. I think he was forced to miss. Does that make sense? By Chris Jones mo- on on those three plays I talked about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there wasn't there wasn't ever a time to me where he was standing back there, not harassed, and just missed a big play. Yeah, but I'd, I'd keep, but he also I mean, didn't make one when he was no, rushed. No, so he, you know, there's but it's it's yeah. really a it's really a fascinating question. It's his first. I, mean, I was impressed with him. I thought he kept his poise. Uh, his, his the biggest stage in sports. He's a better player than people want to give him credit for. Right. And the only reason is because, one, he's got weapons. Two, he was drafted at the very last pick of the draft. Yeah. If he was drafted, like, if, if, let's just say he was a... Which I've been very critical of him because of that. Say if he was a middle seventh rounder, he wouldn't catch the flack that he catches. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, I think it's it's strange how being that pick has has it really changes the opinion on him. All right, we'll take a break. We're going to talk about some wrestling. We can get more Super Bowl, high school basketball as well. Yeah, Mahomes. Sheesh. I don't know what you do. This is like this is like when Alabama would win a national title on their rebuilding year. That's yeah. what this feels yeah. like for the Chiefs. Yeah. We'll be back. Tuesday, February 13th, is the school investment election. The plan provides local students and the Canute community with a renovated gymnasium, including new flooring, new stands, new scoreboard, updated restrooms, accessibility improvements, and more. The plan also includes upgrades to the school's science lab to promote more hands-on learning and experiments. Polls will be open from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. Please take time to vote on this important election, because your voice and your vote matter. How much you want to make a bet I can throw a football over the mountains? The Skinny on Sports. That's what I'm talking about. Welcome back. Skinny on Sports, 98.1 FM, the sports animal. Please be joined by the wrestling guys. Coach Murray, Coach Green. We've got the regional tournament coming up this week for the girls and the boys. All right, Murray, grab their microphone. It's going to be you. You don't need to put those You don't on. have to. Yeah, oh, yeah. You, know, you can just hear us. All right, so tell us exactly how the wrestling regionals work. So let's start out with the girls. Where is it at? When's it at? When is it? The boys is later in the week. Uh, just kind of tell us how, how it goes from regionals, how you qualify for state, and that kind of thing. Yeah, so girls regionals is uh, at Kingfisher tomorrow, actually. So we'll leave today, go up for a seating meeting, and then – uh, they'll start wrestling tomorrow. We'll weigh in at 8 o'clock, wrestle at 10, first session, 5 for the placing sessions. Uh, you got to get top five. You get top five out of your regional, you make the state, get stuck in there in a 10-girl, ten, 10-boy ten ten bracket, and then, you know, battle it out till the one standing. Who all – is it like a conference, or is it multiple conferences that meet for the regional? How does this all work? So what they do is coaches rank uh, throughout the whole year. They split up kind of those top few. They have an east and a west regional, uh, and that's it. Everybody that's stuck in the west goes. So I think for girls in the west, there's 34 teams, something like that. It's it's really big. And they split girls this year. It used to be every girl's school together. So last year we had, was it like 58? We had 58 teams just in the west. Uh, you're able to put one person up at each weight and then – they just they get after it, man. So that, that's my next question. So you've got like, I mean, the most you can do is one for each weight. Yeah. If you have similar size wrestlers, how do you determine kind of who goes up or who goes down? How, how does that all work? Well, so we uh, wrestling is one of the the easy ways to when it comes to playing time. Uh, we <laughs> they wrestle it out. We put them out there. They rank each other. We do that every couple of weeks throughout the whole year, and then we have one final one at the end. And you know, fortunately for us, we got we got the numbers now and the the competition that they're always really good. And we got some kids that are going to be staying at home that you know are, are really quality wrestlers for us. Have done a lot in our program. Who are some of the girls uh, that we can expect to see uh, compete to go to the state tournament tomorrow? Yeah, so we'll we'll be sending five. We we have five in our high school, and a lot of them are younger. We'll have uh, Kenzie Manning. Uh, Kylie Lill, we'll have Madison Holiday, which most people know, uh, Charisma Yank, and Asia Maddox. And so out of that, uh, Madison's actually, she's a two-time qualifier. So she's been there twice. How has the, how long have, has the, girl, have the girls been wrestling? Well, like, girls have been wrestling ever since even I've been in 
there's just never been a girls division. Then the year before COVID, they kind of started that up. And it was kind of just like, uh, here, we're going to see what it looks like. And it is just, I mean, just blossomed. You know, we, uh, there's probably over, I mean, I don't know how many thousands that wrestle now. It's crazy. So at, at, then after COVID, it really picked up. And like yeah. now it's actually gained steam as something that it, it's not just kind of a lollipop out there yeah. for them. It's an actual competition. Absolutely. As soon as they split it and it kind of became its own thing, it just blew up. That's pretty cool. What, uh, yeah. How, I guess, how young do they start? Uh, with the girls, is there a lot of interest there? Here in Elk City, for uh, the girls in wrestling, are these are these girls that you just mentioned? Are they kind of inspiring yeah. those younger ones? Go, hey, you know, if they can do it, I can do it. So, uh, what's crazy about it is, you know, here, you know, they start in seventh grade, and none of them have any exposure to it whatsoever. Now, Madison kind of started that for us because her brother's been in Pee Wee's mm. for forever. So, you know, she started out as a basketball player just like anybody else, and she came over and had a lot of success. And we basically sent her out there to start recruiting. And so, you know, out of the girls I mentioned, you know, three of them are freshmen and, you know, two of them have been wrestling since seventh grade. Uh, one of them, just, a couple of them just picked it up this year, you know. So it's just it's just giving them something else to try and do, you know, and, and they've taken it and they've run with it. And in the junior high, we got about four or five girls as well. So we're sitting about, you know, 10 or 12, and we started out about literally one. So, awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, that's uh, – I guess that's, you know, who – how did they, <laughs> how did they get into it? That was a question that I was going to have. Yeah. Um, on the boys' side, it's yeah. it's been full participation for a little bit longer. Yeah. Uh, talk about how how much better how how the program has progressed since it got started. Uh, what probably a decade ago, or at least. I think it started in 08. Yeah. 08. Okay, yeah, we, so it's we, been that long. We really started wrestling in 08. So I tell a lot of people we're we're usually we're about 30 years behind a lot of these <laughs> programs. Like you know, you got the Clintons and the Weatherfords. Their dads wrestled. Their grandpas wrestled. So, with the boys, we started, me and Murray took it over in 18, I think, 17 or 18. We had about probably eight kids, and now we're averaging over 60 a year. Is that junior high and high school both? Junior high and high school both, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's been pretty good. Uh, You know, as far as success on the boys' side, we've had a state qualifier in every year since about 09, I think, so... We're, we're not winning those tough duels yet. We're getting there, but we're, we are still pretty consistent in the state tournament. So. It's Coach Green and Coach Murray with Hill City Wrestling. Okay, so a lot of people may be thinking, well, wait a minute. I thought wrestling just had their state tournament this last weekend. So it, tell us the process of duels versus <laughs> what's going to be going on this week in the regionals. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> it is confusing because Oklahoma is actually one of the only ones that really does a dual state championship. That's where we're fortunate. Uh, so just like in basketball or softball or anything else, you are in a district. And so, for instance, ours has been, is in Adarco, uh, Clinton, Cash, and Weatherford. And so the winner of that district, they go on to represent your district at dual state. So top eight teams. And then they just wrestle. They match up. They rank each other. Uh, just like kind of softball did this year, they'll rank each other and, and just go after it until one standing. So this year, Tuttle, <laughs> which everybody knows, Tuttle won their 15th in a row. They broke Perry's record, so they have the longest consecutive streak. But that's only on the team basis. You know, the duel is, is the team as well. It's just got scoring points just like anything. You know, uh, that's the one where you got those kids who, you know, step up and maybe have to wrestle kind of out of their weight class. Their regional is just them. It's more of like a solo thing. Okay, so that's – the the dual state is maybe what people are more used to thinking about when it comes to the team like when you see a yes. you know like bedlam wrestling that, yes. that's more of what the dual state is yeah. versus then later on yeah. and and they kind of do the same thing right they have a dual and and then the the regular national championships once you get to college is that is that true well so college is actually they they don't do that they wrestle their duels all throughout the whole way and kind of whoever's there at the end is they're not given a championship. They're just the top team. Where theirs comes from is the team race at the tournament, okay. which we have as well. But uh, one team will – whoever gets the most points at the end wins. Okay, so they don't actually just go mano right. a mano against somebody. They just You add up right. how your individuals do once you get to the meet. Right. All right, so where is the boys' regional this week? We don't have to travel very far this time. We go right to Clinton. So we're wrestling at Clinton Friday and Saturday, weighing at 9, start at 11. Uh, there's just two days, just – few more kids and, uh you know it's gonna be tough we got a tough regional man we got some tough squads coming out we got five of the eight teams that made dual state coming our way oh my goodness yeah 
That doesn't seem right. <laughs> no, nah, it's you know the East this year. They had a lot of they had a lot of teams ranked up there, and so it's the same thing though. And this is where it's kind of skewed though. You rank based off the team and how well they are. Well, you know some teams have really good individuals, so they kind of get lost in the mix. Mm-hmm. And so to split them up, they send them out here. Well, then the West, for instance, this year goes up and just dominates dual state. Well. Now we get stuck with them and some East teams. We got Poto and Fort Gibson coming all the way to Clinton. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a weird mix. Now, Jared, I'm not real good with the new geography, <laughs> but it seems like Poto and Fort Gibson. If you want to think of a team that could be on the east side, uh, Poto would be one of the first handful that I'd name. Yeah. Yeah. So I've always tried to correlate with um, wrestling and how it helps other sports football yeah. you've seen a lot of those guys i'm guessing uh, name some of those guys you're doing both of that oh yeah absolutely uh last year we had a graduate aiden long he started wrestling in junior high for the sole purpose of wanting to be a better football player then that was going to lead into my yeah. next question <laughs> and then, you know it, it, it does a lot of things that makes you tougher i mean it mentally it's probably the toughest sport you could be in i have kids ask me all the time is wrestling tougher than football absolutely it is so aiden long comes to our program ends up being a two-time state qualifier and then graduates and he, he did a lot for our program you know you think back to the felix gonzalez's of the world like those guys they were all football players first and they decided to come out to wrestling to get tougher get stronger get a little more more mentally capable and that's kind of where we're at right now i mean i encourage all the football players that aren't basketball players like come on out to wrestling see i sure. you, you you'll watch it almost almost every other game a college football game i'll watch on tv and they'll say that kid was a wrestler in high school and and I've always you know especially linemen too. Oh, absolutely. It, I'm, I mean, I see all the suitor stuff in here. Creed Humphrey, mm-hmm. he was a state champion right. in wrestling. Uh, the Sexton kid at OU right now at Deer Creek. I don't know if he won a state title, but he was he's, he's yeah he's a state placer. So a lot of your big time old linemen in college football, a lot of those guys wrestled, and it's really good. for You them. say it's 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 harder in football, and I agree. Just seeing it, is it mentally tougher because it's more of a one on one or yeah, I, just, I would I would absolutely agree because you're out there on the map by yourself. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We, we, yeah, me there ain't nobody to blame but yourself exactly. and get your butt whipped. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no oh you were supposed to block that guy. No, no, oh, it's yeah. you. <laughs> absolutely, we can't hide anybody on the football field. You can hide some people. Sure, I mean, but wrestling, you're out there by yourself, and there's not a whole lot we can do for you. What's the atmosphere been like in uh, the Pioneer Center? I assume is where you guys do. It. What's the atmosphere been like, fans? And it seems like a perfect gyms are perfect for wrestling because of the way they're set up. Oh, and, and, and yeah. Pioneer Center just seems like it was made for that. Yeah, the Pioneer Center. We used to wrestle in the junior high gym, uh-huh. and, and we liked it because you get ten people in there. And oh, it's loud. It's loud. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. I mean, I went to school when Cade was playing and stuff, and it was a madhouse. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot how loud it was in there. So going to the seventh grade boys basketball <laughs> game this year, and there is there's fifty people, and you're going, man, I can't even hear. I can't even talk to my wife. It's so loud. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So it was about was it 2019. You know, we had Will Wright. He was a four-time state qualifier. And he's like, Coach, we really want to wrestle in the Pioneer. So Murray went and talked to Coach Hunt. We got it set up. We wrestled one duel that year. And then ever since then, we just started wrestling the Pioneer. I mean, anybody that walks in from another school that have, hasn't been here, they're like, man, this place is nice. Y'all need to host regional or something like that. So it's been it's been really great. I, I, now, I, okay, let's up it. I've seen one, uh, I won't say where, but they did it in their Performing Arts Center on the stage. Yeah, I've, I actually so saw that Coach on Twitter. Coach Hunt needs to get on that, right? Yeah, yeah, we might be able to host one right there in the <laughs> right there in the Kelly O'Hara Theater. In, in yeah, the O'Hara for sure. Yeah. All right, uh, individually talked about the girls. Braxton Robertson has obviously uh, been fantastic. Senior this year, a hundredth win just the other day. Talk about him and, and his prospects in moving on from the regional into the state tournament. Yeah, so you know when we first got Braxton, Braxton's one of those kids that is fortunate. He's, he's wrestled for a long time. He was able to get in the Pee Wee program and had a lot of success. Uh, you know, and when he came up to us as a freshman, you know, he was kind of still trying to mature a little bit, and he had what I call that Pee Wee mindset a little bit. You know, we get those kids who've done it a long time, and they find out real quick that this is a little tougher game whenever you get to those older kids. And, you know, he bought in not just as far as wrestling and, and believing in us just like we believe in him, but, you know, the weight room was his big asset. You're talking about football players, you know, something that I think uh, – uh, you see hand in hand with him as well, and I'll tell you where I've been the most uh, pleased with Braxton. He's been such a great leader for us in the room, and, and in this sport, that's huge. Uh, 
you know, not everybody wants to show up every day and, and, and just get beat up all day. And that's what it is. You know, we got kids who are wrestling hurt, have been wrestling hurt all year. They don't complain about it. Uh, and Braxton's one of those kids, you know, he, he, he's gonna, he should have a good shot to, to get back to the state tournament. He's uh, prided himself on getting that 100th win, but not many people understand that he's wrestled at 215 all year for us in duels so that we can fill our lineup. You know, so he goes out there, gives up 15 pounds, and never once has complained about it, doesn't care who he's wrestling. You know, he's going to go out there and he's going to uh, give everything he's got. And I think it's been a direct uh, – had a direct influence on our team, you know, to have kids like that in our program. Uh, you know, I tell people all the time, we, we might not have the best wrestlers. And, and like Green said, a lot of our kids are 30 years behind. Uh, but we pride ourselves on working harder than other people. And, and, you know, I really feel like when other teams come in and practice with us and you see how they crawl out the doors afterwards – that that's you know it's because of people like Braxton pushing each other. So uh, Tuesday tomorrow, yep. girls regionals. I assume it's at the high school gym up there at Kingfisher. Yep. And then the boys Friday, Saturday over at Clinton inside the dome. Yep, in the dome. What time? How, how do people? What time do they need to get there if they want to go watch this? Uh, so they'll you know like boys for instance they'll weigh in at nine o'clock they'll wrestle at eleven so matches will start at eleven so if you're there. Uh, you know, ten fifty, your perfect time. Now, when Tuttle comes to town, and people don't understand this, they bring their town. So, if you want a good seat, you gotta get there a little <laughs> earlier. <laughs> yeah, it was so funny. We were sitting there at Kingfisher after the basketball game Friday. We see this bus roll through Kingfisher, and I'm like, "They played Clinton in basketball," and then I, and I went, "Ah, oh, they're coming from Enid. That's where yeah. the the wrestling was." Yep. Yeah, and it looked, that bus was, like, jumping. So they were still partying all the way from, <laughs> <laughs> from me to Kingfisher. All right, so tomorrow uh, up at Kingfisher for the girls, regional tournament, Friday and Saturday for the boys over at Clinton. Thank you, fellas. You bet. We appreciate it. Appreciate you coming yes, by. Absolutely. Appreciate what you uh, what uh, all you do. And I guess – what are you? What uh, I know where you're going in the in the in the, uh, in the spring. What are you doing in the spring, Coach Green? Oh, uh, well, I had Coach Zeno's – hurting my arm for a while to uh get me out there to coach a little soccer <laughs> so i'm gonna oh, put no. all my soccer knowledge to use you know what i mean but no it's gonna be fun i'm gonna get you out there get the kids hyped up and let's get after a little you've got little soccer and murray got junior high golf i'm not gonna tell you who won that one <laughs> yeah he definitely won <laughs> he's gonna be playing more golf than I am this spring, guarantee you. hey thank you thank you fellas good luck this week hey, appreciate it guys thank you head coach kayla murray and coach green oak city wrestling they got the regionals coming up. Girls tomorrow, boys Friday and Saturday. We'll take a break. We'll come back. Hit some high school hoops. District tournament started in the smaller schools. Maybe some more Super Bowl. Although, I'm about done with Super Bowl. Yeah, put a hey, bow on it. Let's, let's see if we can get Sean in here to talk about the Super Bowl. Not. I'm out. <laughs> Everybody have a, We'll be back. Skinny on sports right here on a Monday. Hey, Western Oklahoma schools, listen up. How would you like to win a $5,000 interactive smart display for your school? Thanks to video reality and audio video business in Oklahoma City, you could be awarded one. Here's how. From now through February 28th, anyone can text in one time per day through the entire promotion. The winner will be announced during our live coverage on the ParagonTV.com and Cool 94's coverage of the Saturday, March 2nd Class A and B Basketball Championships. Here's how to participate. The text line number is 580-225-960. And in the text, simply type in the one word name of the school you choose to support. We are so proud to partner with Video Reality that through their gracious gift in this promotion, some lucky school will be awarded a $5,000 interactive smart display. Remember, send a text to 580-225-9697. Type in your school's name. It can only be one word. And send it. Limit is one vote per day per phone number. Good luck. Video Reality, your audio, video, and control experts. The Skinny on Sports. Yeah, they say this guy scratches himself better than he throws a ball. Welcome back. Skinny on Sports, 98.1 FM, the sports animal. Hanging out here on a Monday. We appreciate Coach Caleb Murray, Coach John Green of Elk City Wrestling stopping by to fill us in a little bit on how the wrestling playoffs work. Regionals coming up tomorrow for the girls. Thursday, or I'm sorry, Friday and Saturday. For the boys, regionals for the girls and Kingfisher boys is over in Clinton inside the Tornado Dome. You know, growing up, my sister was a wrestling manager. Oh, really? And she would keep score and all that. I mean, she knows the sport. Like, top, and she knows it. And she became a fan of it to this day. And so there's times I have to refer to her and go, well, how does this work? How did that, how did that guy get a point? I don't understand. And she'd just tell me and. Pretty interesting. Yeah, the point thing, I wasn't going to 
get into those weeds. Oh no! Yeah, it's I, I'm still on how little, to actually score the matches. Yeah, yeah. But if you ever watch it, I mean, if you if you get away, I think you get points that, for getting away. Like Takedown, writing around, time, kinds of stuff. Yeah, get away and. But anyway. just I've I've got caught up in it watching some wrestling before, and it's pin them. It is interesting. If you go ahead and pin somebody, that's a good thing. I mean, I've watched wrestling my whole life. I just don't understand. Why don't they bring out the folding chairs? It just <laughs> isn't the same wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's I don't good. remember it, there being a point system for the Hulkster. <laughs> it's either you won or you lost, right? Um, but that, uh, kudos to those guys, though, building that program. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can remember that. So I wasn't sure. I mean, time just flies, right? I wasn't 100% sure when, it when was, exactly yeah. it all got kicked off. I think it was well after we were out of high school. Yeah, 2008. There you said. go. Okay. What John said. All right. Um, high school basketball playoffs got underway for classes A and B this weekend. District tournaments were held all across this great state of Oklahoma. There were some... Interesting results. Oh, here's one. Never mind. It was backwards on our text message. I didn't see it. Uh, I was going to say interesting results that the Cheyenne on the boys' side beat Shattuck, but I must have read it wrong. It was Shattuck won that game. Now that I'm looking at the bracket. Uh, Hollis out. That's really the only... It's the only team that lost in the Paragon Network that wasn't playing each other. I mean, obviously, Knut and Arapaho Butler went at it on Saturday in district finals. Eric and Hammond went at it on Saturday in district finals. But other than that, I mean, in, other than both those Hollis teams, everybody moving on into the regional tournament in some capacity. Yeah, it's a good sign. Good sign. Um, even I, uh, most impressive win for me was, did I say that right? Cheyenne girls winning. Yes, Cheyenne. Yeah. The Cheyenne Raiden Lady Bears beat Canton forty three twenty seven. Canton's a ranked team. I say most impressive, but when I saw the final, I thought not shocking. It didn't shock because I've been Cheyenne girls are one of those up and coming teams. You just never know with a team that young exactly how they're going to handle it, right? You just don't know. And Canton came in twenty one and three, ranked number twelve in Class A. Yeah, that's a that's a really impressive win. Yeah. Yeah, very, very good. Very impressive win. They'd won 10 in a row. Canton won 10 in a row, including over Class B number one Dover. That's impressive. Dover's lost twice. Once to Geronimo and once to Canton. Very impressive for Cheyenne. No doubt about it. So the Lady Bears, all right, let's run through this. Lady Bears will play 6 o'clock Thursday in Carnegie against Navajo. And the winner will play Cyril or Sentinel as uh, Coach Carter's team. Got uh, got a, a district title. They had to win twice. They beat Hollis and Sterling. So there you go. That's their uh, – Canute gets Wacomas. They played, haven't they? Didn't they play up at Moreland? Girls played them in the finals at okay. the Moreland Holiday Classic. Got the win on that one. I believe by, it was double digits. Uh, kind of one going away. It was close going into the fourth quarter. If they uh, win that one, so yeah. And then the boys will get Wacomas too, but it will come through the consolation bracket. They fell to Arapaho on um, uh, Saturday, and, and I mentioned a team that's young but talented. And you, if you get them on a good night, if they get going. That that was Arapaho on Saturday night. They are uh, Ryland Moore's a a player. He's kind of held in check until late. Uh, Deshaun Washi, he's a junior. More, by the way, a sophomore. Uh, Deshaun Washi, a junior, couldn't miss from outside. He finished with over 20 points. I left my score sheet downstairs. I believe it was around 21 points, four three pointers. So uh, hard. Uh, and and you knew what we were going. You knew Coach Rogers would get him there, right? Or get him up, and they can get better too, which is scary. So now they get a, a ranked Drummond team in their home gym, and they've really set it up nicely for them. As a subsite to the region, they now host, I think, number seven Drummond 
and see if they can keep that going. So it was an impressive win for Arapaho Butler. Knut's just going to have to, um, uh, I mean, outside of uh, Jake Butler had a good night. He had four three-pointers. And this is coming off a night where he he set a week ago at Corn Bible. He got that crud that's going around. Came back, and I was real f- afraid of he'd be rusty. He came out. I mean, if it wasn't for him, that the score would have been even more lopsided. Four three-pointers, finished with 19 points. He was uh, our Rob Ranch player of the game. But Canute has, I mean, it, he he needs help. And when Jackson Beck is held to just one three-pointer, which came in garbage time in the fourth quarter, that is not good. He came in that game averaging around four three-pointers a game uh, at the, of the last three games. So, And that was um, – and, and Arapo had a great defensive plan where they did not give Canute any room uh, on the perimeter. Zero room. So you either have to beat us inside, dribble drive penetration, or hit some really long shots, and that's what Butler actually was doing, just hitting like NBA threes. But um, back to the drawing board for Canute, and they will get Wacomas, um over in Arapaho on Thursday afternoon. And looking ahead, I mean, there's the potential of a of a fourth meeting between Arapaho and Canute if things happen the way I think they could happen on Saturday over in Union City. So. I don't think they're done with each other yet. Should be should be interesting. Girls were easy winners. Uh, Canute uh, just wasn't a Rappos night. Um, Kendall Schuster, unstoppable. Her second double double of the year, sixteen and twelve uh, for the sophomores. She was my uh, Rob's Ranch player of the game in that one. It's the sixth time Canute has held an opponent to twenty points or less. Yeah, I went back and counted it. That that was impressive. Yeah, that Saturday there was a couple of games where every time you guys would text the scores at the quarter one team scored a bunch and the other team wasn't scoring at and all. it was that one and it was obviously eric and hammond on the girls side as well uh but um yeah i think man canute's interesting girls yep yeah and and only gonna get more interesting <laughs> i mean this feels like with what everybody knows is coming not only young players in high school but obviously junior high and, and younger i mean they they might very well make it to the state tournament this year and this if they if they don't this year there's gonna be a whole bunch of them in a row starting next year you know what i'm i mean this is oh yeah <laughs> this is just the tip of the the yeah. very very tip of the iceberg with what Canute basketball is going to be the, on the girls' side. It's, the program is oh my gosh, full of youth that are incredibly talented. Going down, I mean, clear I'll, down into the I'll, elementary school. I'll toot my own kids' <clears throat> teams horn. I mean, you got Coach Redling's daughter on that team, and um, a couple. I mean, there's they're a good squad that has already been playing together for a long time, and we hope that continues. And oh. of course, the junior high is. They went undefeated this season, and nobody even really gave them a challenge. And it's going to be interesting. It's it's looking up for Canute girls basketball, and the boys too. I mean, you got four sophomores, yeah. five that can, six that contribute on that team of all sophomores that are capable of being really, really good. And um, so, hopefully, uh, they get to do it in a nice renovated gym. That's the thing about the boys is you forget <laughs> how young they are. I know. They're better than they it, were last year. I mean, year. It, feel, it feels like, God, what are they doing? And then you realize, well, they got four sophomore starters. I mean, it's just kind of the evolution I, of the way I it goes. have to remind myself yeah. that all no doubt. the time. So these are – most of these guys just got their driver's license last year. You know, I mean, they're they're young. They're kids. They're young. They're going to make mistakes. But but the talent is there. And when they could put it all together, and for the most part this season they have. Another young one. Another young team. You mentioned Arapo Butler. And yeah. how much better they've gotten. Mm-hmm. There's another young boys boys team that's coming, and that's the Hammond Warriors. Yes, yes, the Hammond Warriors. If if it wasn't Cheyenne Raiden, if it wasn't Arapo Butler, as far as the uh, the most impressive teams of the weekend, it's Hammond on the boys side. Uh, they absolutely they're coming, man. They are, and I know they had a little lull in there. Kind of, you know, it, it felt like, oh, they sort of started to arrive at the Warrior Classic, getting all the way to the finals. I mean, then taking Lu- and, Sentinel and down taking to the Sentinel wire, right yeah. down the wire. And then Coach Johnson's son out for a couple of weeks. You know what I mean? Like, it, it didn't just continue on the way it looked like it was going to. He had some weird losses at times, but here they are back at, at, at full strength. Watch out. 
I know that I originally picked Granite to go to the Class B Boys State Tournament in our Tucker Family Beef 8 for State. And when you – I forgot that that game was going to happen Thursday. And it scared me. It scared me off of them. <laughs> because I, I was afraid that Hammond was going to beat them. And then trying to go five straight is extremely difficult if you lose on Thursday in, in that regional winner's bracket game. So that I was impressed – not only winning, but by the margin, that it felt like they controlled that game from the very beginning, <clears throat> at least from the scores that were being texted in at the quarter break. So that's uh, there's some youth. There, there's some really, really good teams that are extremely young that are going to continue to be really good teams here for the foreseeable future. Yeah, they're going to shock. They're they're going to there's going to be some upsets. We saw, I guess we can call them upsets on. Uh, this past weekend, you mentioned Cheyenne girls, you mentioned uh, Rappo Butler boys, but I don't think they're done. I think they're going to get some more wins and they're going to raise some eyebrows. And then if we can get some of these teams in the state tournament and, and then we can, we could probably expect them to return their next That's few right. years and get them on a roll here. It's, it's exciting. It's exciting times. Yeah. It, it didn't seem like, I don't think there was a top eight team that lost. Was there in any I don't think so. I didn't dive too much into it. I looked at scores trying to remember who was in the top eight. I don't think there was um, in the entirety of A and B, boys and girls. There, but there was there were some teams just outside the top ten that did. And so now I think, you know, district, the teams kind of make it. You know what I mean? I mean, this you can almost, outside of a couple – you can kind of pencil in what's gonna who's gonna play Thursday. We could have done that two weeks ago when we saw the brackets. Yeah, a lot of a, and a majority of of the areas or the regionals or whatever you want to call it around the state. But Thursday is where things can kind of shift, where you get a little bit more good on good. And uh, we talk we'll, we'll talk about it all week. Thursday is one of the biggest days in the playoffs to me that there is. Mm-hmm is because the difference in winning Thursday night and losing Thursday night is immense. You're two games away from the – you're two wins away if you win Thursday. You're five if you lose. And that's it's a hard road to be able to make it from yeah, on, on Thursday losses. Right. Also got uh, 2A through 4A starting this week. Elkett's and the Big Elks went up to Kingfisher. They're next to last – Regular season games. Man, the girls just played a bad first half. It, it was reminiscent. It was almost like their season in a nutshell. Like, you know, before Christmas it was rough. After Christmas they've been pretty good. And that's the way that game was. But In the first half it was rough. Turning the ball over against a, a really good Kingfisher team. I thought Kingfisher was very, very good. They made the state tournament two years in a row. I would assume they'll have a great chance to get back. They, they've got a good mix of, of shooting, athleticism. Uh, Reagan Snyder down low. Elkett's had zero answer for her. Six foot tall. She can handle the ball. She can shoot kind of mid-range. I think she even fired up a three. Uh, made seven of eight from the free throw line. She had a good touch. She was a good player. Uh, she had 24. But the Elkett's, after falling behind, and it was 42-19 with like two minutes gone in the third quarter. They outscored Kingfisher 27-24 in the second half. And and listen, that, that wasn't because Kingfisher put their other players in. The Elkettes started to climb back, got within 13, had a three in the air to cut it to 10 about halfway through the fourth quarter or so. And then from there, it kind of went from 13 to 17 to 13 to 15. You know, yeah. in there, ended up being uh, – Kingfisher wins like 60 to 44 was the final. But that was – it was a microcosm of the whole season. Uh, and then the Elks – just battled. It was not pretty on either side. I think it went into overtime at 34-34. Bowie hit a big three to put Elk City up two in regulation. Then Kingfisher tied it. Uh, but then in the in the in the overtime period, Alex Cup with a huge drive and one was the first scoring with about a minute and a half left. And then free throw the free throw line wasn't kind throughout the night, but it was at the end. And uh, the Elks, I think they end up five of six from the free throw line. Or maybe three of four. It was three of four, and then the end, eh, something like that. Four or five, yeah, four or five, because they had the end one, and then they they missed one of of four once they got in the bonus. So yeah, for four, four for five, no, five of six. 
Five of six with a bucket. I can't remember. Anyway, they won 41 to 37, so they scored seven points. Five of those came from the free throw line. They might end up being five of seven on that last one that missed kind of on purpose because the clock was like 1.6. Anyway, uh, the Elks closed the game. Uh, they couldn't do it against D- Duncan the night uh, on Tuesday night. They did close it against Kingfisher. I have no idea how long it's been since they beat Kingfisher in boys basketball. I was going to say. But that's the first time I've seen it. Yeah. Since uh, this is my eighth year as uh, the play-by-play guy for Elk City basketball. That's the first time I've seen it. First time it's really even been close. Um, and so a big win, good win. Now games tonight down in cash. Final regular season games of the season as the Big Elks and the Elkettes will travel down to cash. Bulldogs beat the Elks pretty good in the Washington tournament. Elk City was without a couple of guys. So we'll see. Uh, the girls' game, it's a chance for the Elkettes to kind of get back on track, get a win before district on Saturday here against Bishop McGinnis. So high school hoops, man, it's hard to believe we're three weeks away from it being over. That is a um... – yeah, it's we always like, say that, but it's, no, it's like mind-boggling. It flies. Oh my goodness! And yeah, these playoffs will fly, and we're we're about to get busy <laughs> with, with some traveling. But uh, we look forward to it. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to all these Western Oklahoma teams to continue with this success. It was a very successful weekend for them. Kind of sucks when two of them have to play each other, like Rapo and Canute did, and yeah, Eric and, and Hammond. And Eric and Hammond. Kind of wish they were apart. Oh. Best time of the year is correct. There is no doubt about it. I mean, we, we say it every year when we're there. We say it go leading up to it. You know, that first weekend in March, this year it's what? The 28th, 29th, and 30th? Or 1st? or 20th, 29th, 29th, and 1st, and 2nd. Okay, yeah, because it's four win, days. Wednesday yeah, that's right. Saturday. Yeah, so 28th of February through the 2nd of March. It's the best week of the year in Oklahoma high school sports. The small school state tournament at the big house. And... It's not going to be the last. We thought it was going to be the last, but it's not. There'll be two more of these in the big house before the new arena gets completed. So don't tear the chairs out just yet. We're going to need them (laughs) next year. (laughs) Yeah. It's going to be fun. I really got a bad feeling somebody's going to start doing that. Try to take some mementos, some souvenirs. You know, I wouldn't – I don't – there may not be many places to sit for OIE next year. I know. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> After the 2A and 4A state tournaments. Everybody have a great day. You've been listening to the Skinny on Sports podcast with Aaron Cow. Be sure to hit that subscribe button to get alerts of when the latest podcast is available. Thanks for listening. That ball is blistered to right. Way. Tuesday, February 13th, is the school investment election. The plan provides local students and the Canute community with a renovated gymnasium, including new flooring, new stands, new scoreboard, updated restrooms, accessibility improvements, and more. The plan also includes upgrades to the school's science lab to promote more hands-on learning and experiments. Polls will be open from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. Please take time to vote on this important election, because your voice and your vote matter.